So the team was pretty um, chuffed about uh, the uh, chat we are set to have today, and you know everybody in the Google and team uh, we love, and uh, everybody speaks very highly of uh, what the entire roster that Google and has been put, uh, been able to put together. So it's really exciting to see uh, the work that you guys are doing as well. I guess we'll talk about some of it today. Yeah. All right. It's funny. I, I I always think back to the beginning. Like I remember, I I knew he was gonna gonna be CEO. I knew he was for a while. And he, uh, the day I met him, we sat in a coffee shop, and I said, and he, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm gonna build. I'm gonna take all on-chain data. I'm gonna put it in a database, and uh, because all people are gonna need all Ethereum data structured and normalized at some point in time. And I said, great. But how are you gonna make money? He said, I have no idea. He said, but I will somehow. <laughs> and I said. And I laughed, and I remember, but Ganesh is like, Ganesh is a pretty serious guy, and he yeah. was like, he had this idea of like doing reports and like almost like being a Masari. That was the original idea. Yeah, but I just oh, didn't I see. see it. I, I just didn't see it, like not like not in a bad way. I was just like, there's not enough interest, there's not enough anything, and like it wasn't like it wasn't like a dude or something else. We could just build the charts. So uh, I thought it was interesting, but I sort of said, hey, well, this is like it's a good idea. I like you. Everything you're saying makes sense. So let's just sync up in like a little bit and see where this goes. And then like maybe I think two years later, two years went by and he said, and he pings me out of nowhere and he says, hey, I think we have product market fit. What are you, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm playing around in DeFi and having fun and don't really want a job. And he said, well, you should come and take a job and do something. And so I said, eventually he convinced me to join. And that's sort of the story, actually. Like that's actually the full story of how I ended up here. Oh, I see. I, I I love that, and you know, it's it's always a pleasure connecting the dots in in hindsight because you start with a vision and then the market gives you feedback, you iterate, and you end up somewhere else. Like you know, initially, you were planning with going down the more data report driven route, something like Mesari to where it is today. I I am pretty sure there is a lot to kind of unpack yeah. in there. It, it was oh. like that was that was the idea. I, I just think it's a, it's like you sort of have to to your exact point. You have to listen to where the market is, and in some cases, like it's not like he was like we were anybody was wrong about building a Masari or a research desk. It just the market wasn't there, right? It is it just, it, it wasn't there back then. But it's it's sort of a blessing in disguise because you know we we've had th- that just gave us two years to build out a data pipeline product uh, where there was no competition, no one in the market, and so. By the time you're seeing a lot of other people come to market now, who are who are funded, who are building data products, you're seeing they're like, they've raised all this money, but their TAM is very small, or they don't understand the market, or they don't have customers built into this, or they don't understand the space at all because they're so native from Web two. And then when your entire market dries up, or the, not the entire market, but the bulk of your market dries up in a bear market, uh, it's tough. It's really really tough. Like I'm seeing some of like one of our one of our competitors that got funded recently. Um, and they're already done. Like uh, somebody I know and I talked to, and I really like the team. But I was I was really surprised to see it. It's interesting. Like it's, this is not a slight against them. I, like I knew it was tough, but I've seen in the last like three months, I'd, I think one person I know pivot out of the space, uh, one person make a giant pivot, um, and then two people who are just done. Like they are gone. Wow, that's that's intense. And I think uh, Vitalik came to India a few days ago, and uh, some yeah. of our team got the chance to meet him. And really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, more specifically, uh, Raghu got the chance to meet him. And uh, what Vitalik actually told us, uh, uh, like, this is a secondary conversation that I kind of was a part of. But um, his idea was that you know we don't want to build Ethereum to be the fastest blockchain, or we don't want it to have the biggest data blob size or any of that. We just focused on surviving. That's all we did. That's all we are kind of going to do. It's survival, and. In crypto, I guess, with a long enough time span, uh, survival becomes uh, probably your motive, you know, like Lindy, so to speak. But uh, it's it's amazing to hear uh, this journey that you also just kind of uh, touched upon briefly. I, I think that's it. And the thing, the reason why uh, it's funny, because during the bull market, I think like we made our, a, lot, a lot of people knew, start, became very familiar with who Covalent was in the bull market. Um, yeah. It's felt like from a developer perspective, most I think a lot of developers in Web3 know Covalent. But what's interesting is that in a bull market, everybody was hyped, was more aware of what we're doing, who we are, et cetera, et cetera. But in a bear market, like even say, this is my third crypto bear market. And every oh, wow. it's, it's calming, it's relaxing, and it's nice. 
uh, <laughs> because all of the people who are shilling bad projects who don't want to build good things who are in it for a quick buck leave. Everybody leaves, uh, and there's some enthusiasts who are here to build a good tech um, and or to build cool projects or their hobby projects. And I think those are the people that I'm like I've been in that space before. Uh, in the last bear market, we built two projects. Like I built two, we built I built two companies. Um, one of which is still putzing around, it's not doing a whole lot. If you want gift cards so for to, to, to buy to buy a to buy crypto to buy gift cards with your crypto, I can send you a link. You can buy India gift cards for India, so uh, stuff like that. You know, India, uh, US, UK, Canada, a lot of other places in the world. But yeah, like we did, we built that we built that product. Um, built a couple other things. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just an, it's, you can get you can get in a room with a lot of a lot of people. And I think the thing about bear markets is people who are generally a bit more capitalized than you are will will, will, will give you the resources and the things you need to help your your company succeed. Um, yeah, like, I, like we experienced that a lot in the last bull market, like bear market, like maker or die. Uh, the die team was super nice to us when I was building. We we're building this gift card thing because we we're one of the main places where people could pay with die. Um, and so we were one of the first people to accept, to accept it. And like, it's like, it's not like saying you could buy stuff on Amazon or Flipkart, but it's almost as good because you can go and spend your crypto on something. And they really supported us. And we, we were able to make, to make some decent money because of that, I think, you know, going through that spirit and seeing that that's sort of what we're trying to emulate now in this bear market, like saying, Hey guys, we have. Uh, like like the program we're working on together, it's like we have all of this data, we have all of this on-chain data, we have a lot of paying customers. How how do we help the next you know the next group of developers, the people who who really want to build something? How do we give them some support? Uh, obviously, you can't give money to every single person, but like in this case, credits are great, and you know we already have we have thousands of customers. We have over we have a th- over a thousand customers already, so it's good to see that like a lot of these startups are starting to show up and starting to say hey. This is actually a really good program. This is this is amazing, um, and we're sort of seeing this like almost like the AWS startup program that we're offering, but more for crypto data. So it's a little different, but sort of along the same lines. I guess that's our vision of where we're going with it. But yeah, I could speak more to that if you want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love to hear it. Right. I think uh, when I spent some time at ECC a couple of weeks ago, um, while infrastructure was the theme of the season, uh, there was also a lot of talk about uh, this application and adoption. Uh, wave coming in maybe same time next year and uh, when we think about this alternating infra and app cycle and like you know drawing from your experience of uh, three bear markets by the way anybody who says that a bear market is a calming and serene experience is somebody that has built a lot of scar tissue so I'd love to know more about that experience for sure uh, but yeah talking about the infra app cycle point earlier right I'm personally of the opinion that that bridge between transitioning from an infra focus uh, in the industry to an app focus in the industry will be closed by many things. One of them being uh, developer experience. And I think yeah. uh, Covalent lies <clears throat> plays a very important role in uh, building up that developer experience. So uh, how, how do you think about, uh, you know, building things that devs love because uh, most infra projects in the space want devs uh, building on their stack, building using their tools. So, um, how do you think about developer experience over at Google and other work that you do at? So it's funny because that's that that's exactly what we're what we're. That's a, a great question. So what we're looking at right now is um, one: listen to what people are telling you. Uh, you have to listen to people and be be coachable too. You have to know when to push back because the amount I can tell you, speaking factually, like we have, I think it, at one point our, we built I think forty APIs. Uh, that people were using, um, and then the re- and then at the end of the day, I think there's only like five or six. Like the bulk of our traction comes from maybe five or six API endpoints, and that's it. Uh, yeah. I think that that's really it. Like I think it's 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 if you want to build a good developer experience, it's have an idea of what your developer wants, and then you you have to just and this is like I said, why bear markets are great. You have to talk to a lot of people. Um, I think in a bear market, it's about talking to people and understanding that for the, the most part, everyone's in survival mode. Uh, we all know this is the future, and I think people will figure out how to pivot into things and how to do things that um, that, that people want. Like, I, I, I think Polygon's done a really good job of selling into Web2 and hearing their pain points and understanding that. Uh, and because they've sort of, like, tried to build that experience 
in like as a web two experience, I, I, I think it's really knowing your, your developer audience and like who exactly is using what there's, um, I'm going to give a shout out to, it's a really good developer tool. It's called cookbook.dev. Like the moment, the moment I saw this, I looked at it and I said, this is brilliant where they've just gone and curated all of the audited open source smart contracts, labeled them, categorized them. So you could just use them, click deploy uh, and 10 play around. Obviously, you know, you should probably get it audited before you do anything at scale or re audited once you play around. But it's sort of like it does that. And that to me is if, if, you're, if you're not familiar, it's a great developer experience. Um, like what we're doing at Covalent is just getting better documentation, like getting better, getting better documentation once you get that feedback. Um, building more webinars and just like getting in front of people and listening to everybody from someone who's been working on something for two months to someone who's working in the space for five years. Cause everyone has, a, everyone has a valid opinion and it's just gathering that feedback so you could do something with it. Cause I think the thing is like people who've been around here longer, although they may be more seasoned and more battle hardened, um, they're used to working with bad UX and like bad developer experience because that's just the nature of the space. Whereas when you talk to someone who wants to come into the space, who's seasoned and who's seasoned has, has, has an outside perspective, uh, they'll probably give you a very different set of feedback. So I think it's also it's like knowing who to listen to um, and, and also like what type of developer suits your personality and the product you want to build. But I think you have to, like I said, unfortunately, you have to talk to everybody. I think that therein lies a very important kind of judgment call as anybody who's building a developer facing tool needs to make is... Uh, which feedback is signal and which one's noise. Um, so talking about the developer experience in particular, right? Like I'd love to uh, drill down on it further. Um, you mentioned a few components of what makes for a good developer experience. A lot of it is built on solid documentation, um, educational activities, um, obviously a very robust product. But is there anything else that most people you feel miss when trying to uh, think about, you know, driving developer activity and getting that uh, solid onboarding experience in place for these devs yeah the next thing that i i have come to realize is understanding the developer stack for your client like in, in this example um i'll give i'll give an actual example so we work with a lot of wallets so a lot of wallets require you know you require an rpc you require uh you require an rpc you require an indexer you require access to you know one or maybe multiple blockchains um in some cases they require an oracle and in some cases they require something like EP or, or a push push protocol like push notifications or notify. Um, so you see the d different developer experiences, um, and but the, but the, the things that, that a wallet needs are are universal. Some wallets will opt to build their own indexer, but they're few and far between because it's a huge pain, and then you have to maintain it. But I think you need to understand what else fits into your develop your your client stack, the developer stack, uh, and give that and 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 be able to speak to that. So things that we know really, really well, because we, this, is, this is a lot of our customers, are wallets and taxation. And we could talk about those two things all day long with absolutely no problem because we know them so, so well. Um, and I, we also know what goes into that developer stack to build those things. The same thing with gaming. Like we know a lot about gaming because, you know, I could tell you exactly what you need to build a game. We have, we support over 100 blockchains now, like unique bespoke blockchains, uh, all EVM except Bitcoin. And what we've also realized is for to launch your own L1 or your own L2 or now your own L3, uh, you see that people need to have their own bespoke set of infrastructure. And so like we know all the things that they're missing in that as well. So it's not just understanding the developers, but really having an idea of what they're building, what the rest of the stack looks like so you can slot yourself in. Because if you're just showing up saying, hey, you need data or you need to use this SDK, it's not going to go very far. Uh, because you, they, they have their own vision. And in some cases, what I've also realized is a lot of devs don't even understand, fully understand the stack they need to build. They just assume they're like, oh, well, I need this and I need this and I need these 10 things. But the reality is they, they, they might need only one or two products or maybe they'll need like a suite of like eight or nine products, but they don't even know. So I think the more prepared you are with the audience you want to support to understand that everything else, the, the better it is. It also makes doing partnerships easier because you know where you're competing with people and where you're not. I think that's that's a very important piece, right? Like focusing on the developer stack as a whole as well, not just the dev, and then figuring out where the particular uh, like place you kind of slot into based on the entire stack and the integrations that you're looking at. Um, I think one of the points that you mentioned earlier where you have a lot of blockchains that Covalent has integrated with, 
uh, we see a lot of founders, especially in the earlier stages uh, of kind of building infra level products of looking at um, integration with protocols as a growth strategy. Um, and then there is a, a balance that you need to be striking between focus and then going multi-chain as a form of uh, user acquisition. Um, how do you think about, you know, especially when you are uh, an early stage founder, how would you think about uh, being focused on a single chain or, you know, going mul- multiple chains at once so that you can uh, get more users? So That's a really, really hard question. I think it depends on the nature of your business. Uh I think it depends. I, I generally think it depends on the nature of your business and what you're doing. Like if you're de- if you're building a DeFi product, I think focus on your core chain, and then figure out how you can drive liquidity back to the protocol uh, from other chains or other networks or other DeFi products. Right? Like that's that's just the partnerships, and that's how you have to go about it. If you're building commun, if you're building something like like I see Farcaster, uh, they're building uh, they're building social, or you're building um, or like Lens, they're building social also. That it doesn't make sense. They don't need to be on 150 different chains. Uh, it's just go where the action is and go where the users are. And, and, and they're building something, something very different. I think you have to get an understanding of where your users are um, and the people you want to talk to. An example is if you want to build, uh, I saw this thing, this, this, this thing like a couple of weeks ago where these guys are building a DAO around music, around music editing, but they're, fo- they're so focused on getting the editors the editors and they're building some tooling on top of it. So these people could all collaborate and share royalties and stuff. But what they're hyper-focused on is more of the community. And then they're building the tooling to feed into feed into the community. So these people can all share and build these things together. And so I think it's understanding the market you want to serve and having, and having your own vision. I don't think, you know, if you're a wallet and you want to go on a hundred chains, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. Uh, because it's like, it's just, you have to look at, you know, what is your opportunity cost and, what is the go to market and how much like what is, what is the potential opportunity for for being on each chain um, it really depends on on the business itself but anybody who's building community first i would say like figure out your diehard community and if you have a diehard community for something that people love or want or want to be a part of i don't think it really matters what chain they're they're on that's a, a very good answer right like depending on the market you serve you make certain decisions but more specifically if you're building a community first product, then you'd want your first hundred real troopers who will uh, go to war for you. And it does not matter which chain they're on. You just need to find them somewhere. Um, yeah. And so like one thing that you mentioned earlier, which uh, also, you know, was a bookmark when you kind of said it is um, there are, there's a, I'm assuming there's an 80, 20 split between the projects that are using your API. So the 20% of these uh, key projects building on you probably represent 80% of the uh, kind of total usage, but there are also hundreds and thousands of other projects that are using your APIs as well. Um, how do you manage between uh, splitting your focus, right? Like it's very, it, I'm assuming it might be very tempting to uh, focus on the needs of the 20 so that, you know, your uh, usage is kind of your whales, so to speak, are a piece. But at the same time, you'd also want to focus on others so that you have potential of creating more of these wheels, so to speak. So I uh, would, would love to kind of hear how do you think about uh, this balance between the power users and the more general users that you have? We're fortunate that we're, that we're, we're at a size now where we can have, we can, we can split our focus a bit more in the sense that some people are focused on the, you know, uh, we, have, we, have, we have a group of people who are focused on just how do we get more enterprise? How do you get larger customers? How do you do this? And have, you know, for that stuff, you need your SLAs, you need your paperwork, you need your billing, you need all your, you need everything. Um, that's, a, that's one game to play. That is very much one game that we are capable of playing. That's one game we are, we're, we're definitely playing. At the same time, they, when you deal with people at that side of the funnel, all they look at is they want to they, they wanna look at what's been done. They're not innovating. They're not building anything new. They're just taking in from, and I'm not saying this is not a universal term, but I'd say like the bulk of the larger customers, uh, they're taking what other people have done. And then they, they're just, they come from large companies. So they're just doing it. They're, they're getting ready to do this at scale because it's worked in the past. So it'll work for, it'll probably work for them in the future, um, which may or may not be true. Time will tell. It were, I think we're, I, I, I just, I've always been more interested as, as I've worked with startups most of my, most of my adult life. I've worked at a couple, I worked at a few big companies, but even then, like I was running and uh, running an internal VC or something like that with prop capital or other things. But I think 
with that with that said is you need to, the startups come and they really battle test your product. Uh, we we've sponsored a lot of hackathons in the past, even some builder tribes hackathons. Um, definitely, I know we've sponsored a bunch. And the thing that's interesting is all of the really novel, interesting stuff comes from the hackathons, then goes to the accelerators, and then they get VC, and then they get VC funding. I think uh, I, I my my general thesis on this is hackathon projects. Uh, VC VC pro, VCs have a nine to twelve nine to twelve month lag on a hackathon projects um, from getting from getting yeah. from, from getting there. So I think it's like we want to be there to power some of these things. We want to be there to help them, and I think it's just taking a separate team with a separate focus to 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 do that because some things will pay, will pay you a lot of money, right? But I'll, but the thing is, like if you're not serving the people who are coming into the market who need these things and have a team dedicated to them, you're never going to get anywhere. So it's, it's, I think that's, that's the thing. And that's, that's also how you sort of, that's how you build an ecosystem is the people who are coming in, how do you enable them to grow and have them grow with you? Right? Like we obviously want to grow, but if, if we're, we're, I don't think us or anybody in the space is going to get to scale the scale we want to get to, uh, if we're all just chasing each other and, you know, trying to gouge each other for money. Like taking off on the last point you spoke about, because uh, we love to kind of zoom out a little bit and figure out what ecosystem growth actually uh, looks like. And um, you spoke about basically cultivating win-win relationships with uh, your, uh, like builders in your ecosystem so that as they grow, you grow, but you also make it as easy as possible from your end to, for them to grow. Um, and, and what does this uh, actually look like? Like, so a lot of these infra projects will have a heavy focus on ecosystem growth. What elements would you create, put in a ecosystem growth playbook if it exists? I guess it's a little too early, still in the space to kind of have right answers, but how do you think about it? I think it's funny because I always, I, I in the, during the, like we, so, you know, we, we, you guys know this, we just launched a grants program and I'll go into the details of that. But I think it was interesting because I talked to like, I, I'm very good friends with the Phantom team, the Moonbeam team, Polygon team. And I was asked, how are they giving their grants away? I said, because in a lot of cases, you know, when you're doing this, they're, you're giving away money, they're taking this, you're, they're selling the tokens, and then they're just going to do startups that may or may not ever work, or they're bad ideas, they're not fleshed out, and, you know, it's sort of the Wild West of giving projects to everybody, and I said, and there's not a lot of loyalty there, because you don't know how much these people have actually invested in your ecosystem or how much they know. Some team, this is not a universal, this is, it's different with some teams and others, but I think... But I think it's interesting because, like, the results that we got were, like, people were split on the issue. I think what, you're, what we're seeing now is what I – this is back to the point of why I really like bear markets – is we're seeing the projects. Like, we started this program, uh, and we're seeing some – and it's not public. It's only through a handful of partners where we're giving these, these grants. And they're really, like – they're not cash grants, but they're, they're vast credits to our, to our products. So we want people to use them, battle test them, you know, have fun. Um, and get the same experience that somebody like an, uh, an EY would get, as an example, an Ernst & Young would get, who's, who's, who's one of our other customers. Um, but you want the same experience and the same thing that they would get. So I think what's interesting is when you see people come in and start to play around and start to do this, and they're serious, because that's sort of the gauge of like, how serious are these people? Are they, are, they, are, are they in it for cash? Do they want free money? Or do they actually want to build something? And once you see them start building, it makes it way easier to, to get to know them and then say, okay, how do I introduce you to some of your, my bigger customers? Because my ultimate goal here is if you get traction uh, and, these, and once the grant period runs up, you know, and you've, we've given you X amount of dollars of value or in credits, I want you to be able to, to make money. That is my goal. Um, and at the same time, I want you to be able to serve our, cu- our other customers, some of our larger customers or people in and around our ecosystem. Because there are some things that people like projects can solve from our APIs or some things people can solve from... Uh, we built a dashboarding product uh, and there's some things we'll build in house, but the vast amount of projects that like are, are things that will exist in web three will never build. So we would just love to have them built on us and then help them go to market and find those customers because it's net, it's net beneficial for everybody. So I think it's really having that, like having a vision and having an understanding of how that comes together and being willing to put in the time and, you know, uh, being willing to put in the time to help people. And, and, and at the same time, having people who really want to build cool stuff. I think this is something, um, we internally also talk a lot about because as uh, protocols and infrastructure products are trying to grow, um, when they look at hackathons, 
um, where you have a lot of projects coming out and you can see a spike in activity in the short term. But what you're actually looking for is real sustainable use cases being built on top of the protocol who can survive and then grow. And as a consequence, the net value of the ecosystem grows together. And uh, and that's that's really something that we uh, like. And that's the underlying value alignment, uh, which kind of makes our partnership work. Right? Like we love backing serious early stage founders in any way that we can. And uh, I guess this, when these hackers close that pipe, like gap between becoming, being a solid dev and being a founder is where uh, we also like to support them. And, um, you know, through this effort that we are doing together, um, it's, it's going to be super fun for sure. But I'd, I'd love to know, uh, Eric, like, so as a founder who would uh, who'd want to be a part of the Covenant ecosystem, uh, how do they get started and what support can they expect, right? Like one of the things that you mentioned, which I feel not many people know about uh, is the idea that you can actually introduce them to the rest of the network participants you have or, or the rest of the customers, the larger institutions that these uh, smaller players could serve. So what, what support can one expect uh, from the covalent ecosystem as a builder or a founder who's just getting started? Good question. Yeah. So what we always say, first thing is go get an API key. Uh, we, we can't help you. If, uh, we've had calls with people before where they say, hey, I want to do this. How do we work together? And I always say, like, well, have you, have, do you know what we do? And they say, I've Googled it. And I said, have you ever used our product? Have you used or anything? And they say, no. I say, okay, well, step number one. Uh, we can't help you with anything if you don't know what we do. Um, so, or or you, don't, you don't know what our products are good for. So that, that's, I think, step number one. Uh, step number two is, is, is I, I always say this to everybody, I think, you know, we want to help people. And here, we're, our, our first step is that's what we want to partner with Builders Tribe, as well as some other accelerators to give them to give them access to this pro their, their startups access to this program is to say, come apply, let's subsidize some of your operations, you know, let, let's save you some money. And let's see how we can help you get to market a little bit. Obviously, it's going to be pretty lightweight. Um, because at the same time, you, you, you can teach a fish to swim, you can bring a fish, you can bring uh, you can bring, what is this? What's the saying? You can bring somebody it's, to walk. Uh, give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish and you'll feed him for the rest of his life. And exactly. I get what you're saying. Yeah. 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 So it's sort of like, I can, we can do some work, but we can't help build your business for you because that's the ultimate skill you need to do. But it's more like once we see, once we can hey, say, hey, we're subsidizing your cost. We want to keep an eye on you, hear how you're doing. Um, and then if once we see a bit more traction, like any startup would, that's when we really want to help a lot more because- once you once you can say, hey guys, uh, I got a, I got a, a, a ten thousand dollar grant. Here's how it subsidized me for the last six months. Here's what we've been able to do. Here's the customers we've gotten. You know, how can you help me? Then it's a much then it's way easier because I could say, okay, well, what do you need? If they say, oh well, you know, our grant is going to run out in six in three more months. I would love an extension. Or uh, we have revenue, or we have we've grown our users by five hundred percent, and they're all real users. You can check on chain, et cetera, et cetera. Then it's a lot easier to have separate conversations okay, and say, okay, I know, but we know investors, we know other things, we know other customers that might be interested. Let's look at our CRM, pull that up, and see how we can help. Um, and that's where it gets way more interesting because that's when a project has found some PMF or some early adoption or something, and 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 we can just start sharing that with our network, uh, which is sort of the goal, right? Because, like I said, we we want people to. If you want to build an ecosystem, you need people who are going to build on you, but you need to support them. We can't do everything ourselves, but you know we're fortunate that we've got some good VC relationships. Uh, and when we tell them about projects, they tend to take them very seriously. A, a good example of this is like that I always say, especially because you guys are in India, as the BitsCrunch team, like that was all built on Covalent early on, and now they've done. I think they they raised from like Animoca, Coinbase, Chainlink, lots of people. So that's like I think one of the best one of the best examples that I can think of, um, but that was all built on us. So uh, I I, I, th I think of that as a really good example of like how there was no formal plan, there was nothing. It was just things just sort of happened organically, and it just worked out really well for everybody. Bits Crunch is an amazing amazing example, um, and this is something I also did not know earlier. So uh, the fact that um, this support was provided to them at such an early and critical stage and we can clearly see how valuable it's been uh, for everybody involved. Um, so yeah, I think as we kind of uh, walk in, like near the launch of the program that you're working on together, um, 
what what ideas are currently you excited about right like i'm pretty sure there are a lot of builders that would want to work with you guys more closely and are looking to build something seriously but are there any ideas in particular that excite you right now uh, that you would love to see as we open up applications to more and more founders the ideas that i'm personally very very interested in i'm going to get into a bit of the weeds it's it's more on the application side i think like we're I, 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 if you were an ECC, you know, you probably went to the bathroom and while you're standing there, somebody walked up to you and said, hey, do you, can I tell you about my roll-up as a service? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's, there, there's there, first, you know, this happened in, I think it was like 20, 2018, where when Cosmos launched and everyone's like, oh, the Cosmos SDK, we're all going to have these bespoke Cosmos zones. And, you know, we have a lot of them, but it's not, there's, there's problems with the Cosmos. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of like the, the lack of infrastructure and all the other stuff. But that said, uh, it never it never came to fruition, or it did come to fruition to some degree. I think you're you're going to see that again, and I think the the building applications never goes out of style. I think what's really going to drive adoption, and I could be totally wrong. I, I could be totally wrong. Is I think you're going to see people start to build like Web three components into Web two applications. I I, I don't think it's going to be immediately obvious. But I, I get very, I'm personally very interested in things like, uh, like, how do you, how do you, and this is a regulatory question, a huge problem, and I'm not, I'm not advising any of this, but like where I, I, I've been spending my time is looking at things like, how do you take a company that is generating revenue and turn that into a DAO? Um, I'm very, in, I'm, I'm personally super interested in that. Like, how do you have a company that's doing one to two million in revenue, it may not ever be an exit. It may not ever be an acquisition target. It might be a good cash flowing business, but how do you how do you turn that into a DAO and make it functional and practical? Stuff like that, I think, is interesting. I think that's going to be a huge unlock um, because it'll add to tokenization. I think that I'm I'm interested in gaming. I'm a little reluctant. Like I I, I talked to a lot of the AAA studios. I don't think they're here yet. Um, I think there's a, a decent way to go to gaming, but building stuff that integrates or can support Web2 gaming, I think is going to be really interesting. Uh, other things I'm interested in are, I think you will see uh, things that tie blockchain with AI. Like I was, I was looking at something just before this where it was, uh, it was an influencer that is just, it was, it was, it was an influencer. It was like, so I, I couldn't believe that somebody posted it and it was some, this stunning beautiful beautiful girl who is uh talking and she's talking i don't know what she's talking about she's talking about nonsense but she's just standing there and then it's the capture at the bottom 10 seconds in is this is 100 percent entire ai generated from the girl to the background to the voice to everything nothing was real and i think you're your people are gonna have to start thinking about how do you start creating uh demarking ai what like a like building demarking denoting what is ai um on top of published content. I think, I think people are going to need this and I think people are going to need to know what comes from, uh, what comes from AI versus what comes from a human, um, or what is human generated, I think is going to be so important. And then, uh, building data or in building, building blockchains on top of existing database structures. So like example, if we are going to see more AI models, um, if we are going to see more AI models or AI, AI come out, you're going to need to build blockchains to record how much data was sampled from a given database to feed into these AI models. There'll probably be a revenue stream or something that's going to get paid back to that. I don't. I think we've seen people build decentralized databases to do that, or these like data warehouses. I don't think that's the answer. I think it's more like take an existing database and just like slap a blockchain on top of it. I'm not saying that in a negative way, but to some degrees you can do that because you don't need to record. You don't need a decentralized database. You just need to record like who is sampling from that database, right? And who is accessing it uh, in a way that if that, that, that can access like these micro transactions, which may occur to sample from these. So I'm interested in databases. I'm interested in gaming. I'm interested in AI and blockchain, like AI and blockchain, because it seems like the logical thing, because I don't know how we're ever going to deal with all this AI and deep fake stuff uh, if it's not recorded on a blockchain. Uh, and I'm very interested in decentralizing existing Web2 companies. So those are all of my my big my big ideas that I've been that I've been putzing around and writing about. There's like I said, some of them go really into the weeds. Uh, some of them are more high level, but this I, is just for I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure like each and every idea that you were mentioning, I was like, yep, every topic can be a full length conversation on its own. Um, you know, merging uh, web like you know web two point five applications, so to speak, 
um gaming so like one thing that i would maybe add on to when you mentioned gaming is i i personally feel that gaming with some components of prediction markets uh, to further drive adoption through speculation i guess uh, is something that i feel is also pretty interesting we're seeing this talk of gamble fi and things like that going around but um, yeah it's it's uh, an exciting time to live in and a lot of ideas in there for uh, anybody who's building out to uh, kind of explore and uh, eric so w- like what's the best way to perhaps uh, reach you for founders who want to talk to you about these ideas that you mentioned um is uh like is is there a particular place that you want them to go to uh i kind of got a couple things one is like through you guys there's obviously you know we've our grants page um if you're if you want to build something and like even if you're super early stage we encourage everybody to apply uh we want to seed projects and want to see what happens um so like that is one thing is like covalenthq.com/grant or you can obviously go through builders tribe um preferably go to this ride because the you know we 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 we've gotten a decent amount of applications and we want to vet we were this is just it's a quality signal if they come through you guys um so that is one way that is that is one two is just dm me on twitter i check i don't i check most of them uh there's a lot of random nft stuff that i don't respond to but i i i like having these conversations and always like to see people with good ideas uh or hear what they want to build because like i've i spend way too much time reading about these things and like writing out my own thought processes and building token models um of how i think they would work especially this decentralized like decentralizing web 2 like small microservice web 2 companies is 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 something that i'm particularly interested in eric uh, i think one thing i i particularly like for you to kind of share some thoughts on is uh what is one thing that you'd tell any infra builder in the space and who's thinking about ecosystem growth uh what's one thing that you feel most people miss and what's that that you want them to focus on uh build build on top of someone else like i i i'm going to say this cuz like bitfrench is a really good example where a lot yep. of it, I, i some of their stuff still is i think a lot of stuff they brought in house which is fine um but like it's a really good example of them saying hey we can't build this all on our own uh we need to get to market fast we we understand this we understand how to build this we understand what to do but like we are resource strapped and have a million and one other problems to deal with we're never going to get there if we have to rebuild a stack that you guys have already built so i think it's build on top of somebody else if you don't and even, even i said this to a project that's working with us recently they said well you know covalent doesn't offer this doesn't offer that and i said well you can build that yourself i said i want you to, we want you to be successful i want you to build everything here and if you don't you can't build everything on us then i have to you, know, you may have to build some things yourself but that's also good product feedback because you know we'll have to we may have to build these things in the future um and that's just how how life works right uh so i think in that regard it's just leverage as much existing infrastructure as possible and negotiate with the people you're going to be dealing with um like just negotiate with them and like be honest and be friendly uh, i don't think there's anything wrong with that and then you know the faster you get to market and validate with where you're right or whether you're wrong i think is 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 the is the most important thing so you know if if you can sit in a room uh writing code for 6 months uh bef- and and you're not talking and you need to, that is your that is your first step before going and talking to anybody and seeing if anybody really wants it that's that's bad i think you know first is talk to somebody second is build the mvp and and then third is like see how you could scale it on top of everybody else at a reduced you know to subsidize your costs or do whatever you have to do and then you know once you once you have some pmf and you have everything else then you could look to either rebuild or do something else i think that's how i would do it if i was going to build infrastructure again um obviously like times have changed things are very different so if you want to build an indexer today the bar is much 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 higher uh because you know we're starting from we bit like you'd have to go back rebuild our entire stack and i think of just you know like i mentioned earlier at the beginning of the call or the end of the of the space is like we started in 2018 and we had 2 years of no of non-interrupted building talking to people and like building out this database this back end and that's still the backbone of the bulk of 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 the bulk of our stack right because you had two two uninterrupted years to learn every nuance of ethereum and we just got lucky that you know evm chains have been the thing so far um yeah so that that's just my general advice is like build to the least amount you can and just try to get to market as quickly as possible uh just a follow up question to that uh, is this a solution that also scales 
and in covalence experience uh, are there examples of uh, products that have uh, you know kind of gone the build on someone else route and then also scaled it to a significant number of users as well i think rainbow's a pretty good example of that like rainbow built a lot of their internal indexing and then realized like we don't want to do all this for all these blockchains let's just go to covalent and that's literally that's exactly what happened so that's a, that's a really good example i think you see that a lot where there's two, there's two types of things there's the pe- the projects who build on you and then you know you once you get to critical mass and this is like the blessing and the curse of a of a bull market is that the bull markets are great because you get a lot of feedback and a lot of customers and a lot of things the downside is if your tech is not totally battle hardened you're going to see very very high churn like you know we we built a bunch of our APIs and this is where I and it's funny because we're seeing this happen now uh, is like with all these competitors is like we built APIs that were that worked great at the beginning of the bull market but by the time we were like halfway through we realized we needed to go back and re-engineer our, our entire stack so uh, I, I think that's another thing to keep in mind when you, when you're doing that is like you are like if if your suppliers your vendors whoever you work with has to re-engineer your stack maybe it's time to spin off and go do your own thing and like we did see that happen with a couple of people it sucks um but i and i but we're, i'm still friendly with them and i totally i totally see why they did it and we can't hate on them but yeah that's just that's just my general perspective um i think one take away that i would have uh, from this is um you know the very nature of crypto infra being so composable um makes you know working towards positive some outcomes as a very effective strategy um so yeah i don't think we got any questions uh, as such for uh, the time being but uh, you know any any final words to kind of close out the space eric uh, it was a pleasure talking to you we learned a lot and i think i am going to just go back take some notes from the recording of the space and we'll also probably push out a thread from our end but uh, any any uh, points in particular that uh, you'd want to highlight or any final closing thoughts Yeah, I I my 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 close about is really for everybody listening and everyone who's not here and it's just more of a bear market suck. Um don't forget this. They they suck. There's you know, companies go under. There's not a ton of money. But what you generally see is the people who can build through one or two bear markets are generally the ones who stick around uh for subsequent bear markets, right? Which whatever comes next. So I think, you know, you're this is the time to make friends, to learn um to get acquainted and i i just wouldn't get discouraged by prices or bad news it's sort of the way the the space works uh and you know and i i said this also i said like every new bull market there's like when all the attention comes back there's always new heroes who are made and there's always new startups which blow up like i always i think of ave a lot where stanny built eflend and it like quite and it failed horribly and then he pivoted to ave changed a couple things and it just worked um and i think about that a lot and like uh, like i remember eflend and nobody took it seriously and then somehow we off age just clicked so uh i don't know i i i think of that a lot just don't get discouraged and if you really love the space everything will work out yeah yeah i think uh, that's you know we we value this in founders a lot ourselves here like times are going to get hard just show up please show up show yeah. up on a week on week basis <laughs> we value that a lot and we love helping founders who persevere I'll give one last anecdote which is probably relevant cuz you guys are in India but like I I I remember years ago this is 2018 29 it was 2019 it was peak bull market and I went to a conference I was in New York and I see this guy handing out business like little printed out he probably just got them printed tiny business cards uh to to people and he has a backpack on he's in the middle of the conference cuz he doesn't have enough money for a booth and he's saying build on matic 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 and it was Sandeep And I think oh, wow. about that, and I think about this. How I was like, I was like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I don't have." No, he's like, "I don't have money for a booth. I'm just hustling." And he was in, he, he was at the conference with a backpack on, with all this Matic swag and everything, Matic, 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 and just like d- he didn't have money for shirts, he didn't have money for anything else. He was just giving out these little cards, telling people to build on it, and then they just spent like two years or three years talking to everybody, right, and like trying to get every project on. And I and I actually remember when we first indexed Matic. I remember looking at it because we had just indexed BSC and I think Matic was the third chain we worked with and it was, they hadn't rebranded as Polygon yet but I remember saying wow there's a decent amount of transactions here like there's actual usage which I was really surprised by um and I just said this is really interesting and so I I I think about that like those two instances where like the hustle and everything really did pay off and I was able to see it firsthand 
And I'll never forget that as long as I live. Like, and I, and I think it's a good anecdote of just like, you may not have the money, you may not have the attention, but like, if you, just, if you actually keep working and you believe in the space, people will just eventually believe in you. Like, that's an anecdote that I'll think about very often. And I guess I'm going to tell everybody about that story. Uh, this is, uh, this was an amazing uh, chat. And it was a pleasure doing this with you. I guess we've enjoyed it so much that we have another uh, similar session of sorts lined up in the business uh, BD collective that um, Himalaya will be on next week. So uh, I'm super pumped for that conversation as well. But uh, Eric, this was an absolute delight. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, for uh, just a quick note for all uh, builders out here, uh, the COVID in program on Builder Side is about to go live briefly. We'll be making an announcement, so stay tuned for that. But if you are still looking for support from the Covalent ecosystem, um, go to the website, uh, get your API keys if you have it, and make sure you uh, go to the Covalent forward slash grants um, in the in the website. So um, it was it was a delight, Eric. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, kind of doing this with us, and it was a pleasure. My pleasure, today. We'll chat soon. Thanks, guys.